Hello, and welcome to Lecture 3 of Gauss's Law in Phys 1204. And here we are in Lecture 3 of a topic unit called Gauss's Law, and we still haven't even seen Gauss's Law. It's time to fix that. We're about to get to Gauss's Law, but first I'm going to show you another idea that we need for it, and that's that Gauss's Law tells us something about fluxes through closed surfaces, and only closed surfaces. So what I've drawn here is a line charge, and let's think of it as an infinite line charge. So it just keeps going up and down. And here is a surface, which is a cylinder around it. Okay, and so this is a closed surface. It has ends and so on. So that is a closed surface. And what Gauss's law is going to tell us about is something to do with the flux through there. So I'm just going to say let's calculate this flux in symbols. I haven't given you any numbers because they're going to turn out to be rather irrelevant. What we know is that the E field due to an infinite line we've seen before is this expression, where that's the linear charge density and that is our distance from the line charge. That's what this little r is. And the E field, we know, points radially outward everywhere. Now, think about what that means. That means it is tangent to these ends, and it's perpendicular to the sides of this cylinder. So our flux is going to be fairly easy, but I do need to introduce a symbol that you probably haven't seen. So here is our flux, and it is going to be calculated as an integral over that closed surface. So when we do an integral over a closed surface, we draw it this way. Now I'm going to go ahead and write E dot dA. And I'm sure that looks extraordinarily scary. But it isn't, because we know we can write that as a flux through the sides. Okay, so this is going to be an integral, no longer a closed surface if you're only thinking of the sides of the cylinder, E dot dA side plus integral e dot dA ends. But the E field is tangent to the ends, and so we know that flux is zero, and we're done with it. Now let's look at the sides. Well, everywhere we look around the sides, the E field is perpendicular to the surface. And so this dot product is going to be nice and simple because we have a cos theta that is cos of zero everywhere. And so it is just going to be the integral E dA. There would be a cos theta, but it's gone. And so this is over the sides. But the other thing is, Everywhere on this, we're the same distance from the line charge, and so the E field is a constant everywhere on the surface. And so I can just pull it out in front of the integral, the integral dA. Well, that is just summing up all the little area elements, and so it is nothing more than the surface area of those sides of the cylinders. And the surface area of a cylinder is just the circumference of the cylinder, uh, 2 pi r, times its length, which is L. So let's now put in the E field that we know. So it's 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And incidentally, if you're looking at this, you'll see this is one of the reasons why we like writing 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, because we're about to have a lot of cancellation occur. So the little r is big R if we're on the surface, 2 pi r l, and so our r's are gone, and 2 pi takes out most of that 4 pi, and 2 takes out 
2, and all we have left is lambda L over epsilon naught. And think about that lambda L. That is the linear charge density times the length of this cylinder, which means you could write that as Q inside the cylinder. Right? There's an infinite charge on the whole line, but just inside the cylinder, the amount of charge is just the length of this piece of cylinder times lambda. And so our flux has come out to be nothing more than how much charge is inside our surface divided by epsilon naught. Let's do the same thing we just did with the line of charge, but this time we're going to do it with a point charge. And we'll be able to do it very quickly this time. So we're calculating the flux due to this point charge through a spherical Gaussian surface. Remember, all I mean by a Gaussian surface is a closed surface. So here is our spherical Gaussian surface. It's closed. It divides space into a region inside and a region outside. And I've given it some arbitrary radius r1. And we're going to make maximal use of symmetry. We know that the field due to this charge has spherical symmetry centered on the charge, and so we've chosen a Gaussian surface that matches that symmetry. And because of that, the field is perpendicular to the surface everywhere, and it has a uniform magnitude everywhere on the surface. That means writing down the flux is going to be simple. I've skipped some steps because they're exactly like what we just saw, Cos theta is 1 everywhere because the E field is perpendicular to the surface, and the E field is constant everywhere, and so I can just pull it out in front of the integral, and so we end up just with an integral dA, and that is nothing more than A, the area of the sphere. So I've put the E in red and the A in yellow so that as I substitute in you can see here's the field due to the point charge, here's the area of the sphere, and look, the r1 squareds cancel, and the 4 pi's cancel. And so we're left with nothing more than q over epsilon naught. And notice, that is the q, the charge, inside our Gaussian surface. But hey, that's exactly the same result we just found for the line of charge, the charge inside the surface divided by epsilon naught. Is this a coincidence that we got exactly the same answer? Well, as you can probably guess, it's not a coincidence. I wouldn't have shown it if it was just a coincidence. It has to be something more than that. Let's just think about this. Here's an area that's a piece of a sphere. Again, radius r1. And here's another area that's a piece of another sphere, radius r2. And there's the same angle in here for both of them. Then one thing we know is that because the area of a sphere is proportional to radius squared, whatever factor r2 is larger than r1, a2 will be that factor squared larger than a1. Now, the field, there's a field e1 through the area a1. And similarly, there's a field E2, which will be weaker, through A2. But we know that the field magnitude goes as 1 over R squared. And so now when we multiply the area and the E field, we can see that the flux through 1 has to equal the flux through 2. But look at what that means. It means that I can take a charge and make any surface I want around it, and I can think of that surface as being made out of little pieces of spheres like so. And I can transform all of those 
into a single sphere of the same radius everywhere. And that means that no matter what shape I make this surface, the flux is going to be the same. It's still going to come out as q over epsilon naught, just like it did before. But wait a second, that works for a point charge. Now suppose we have some other charge distribution. So here's some other charge distribution and some surface around it. But I know that I can think of this charge distribution as being made up of point charges, right? I would think of it as being made of little bits, and I would sum up the field due to it everywhere as being due to all those little bits, and then I would let the size of the bits go to zero, which is like saying they're point charges. And so the flux due to every one of those little bits is the charge on that little bit over epsilon naught. And so again, when I just add it all up, that means the flux here is also going to be the total charge inside the surface over epsilon naught. No matter what I no matter what shape I make the surface, and no matter how this charge is distributed. Well, that is Gauss's law right there. Gauss's law Gauss's law says that for any charge, for any charge distribution, and any surface around it, the flux is always equal to the, in, the charge inside the surface over epsilon naught. Now, like I said in the previous lecture, we don't use this to calculate fluxes. We really don't care about the fluxes, but this gives us a really powerful way to calculate fields because this is an integral over a field times an area element. And that means particularly if we can arrange for symmetry so that this integral is easy to write, we can often solve for the E field very easily this way. I just gave you a justification for Gauss's law. It's not a proof. To really prove it, you need some multivariable calculus that many of you will never see and the rest of you might see next year. But here's one other piece that I, I again can't prove, but I can at least justify. What about charge outside the surface? Do we need to worry about its contribution to the flux? And the quick answer is no, we don't. And if you think about it, here's what it is. There is some flux due to the charge inside, passing out. And every field line that leaves these charges passes through our Gaussian surface once and only once. But now let's think about the field lines coming from our charges outside the surface. Field lines from here will tend to pass into the surface at one point and out of the surface at another point. And what is guaranteed to happen is because the ones passing in lead to negative fluxes, if you think about how cos theta works, and our area elements are defined to always point out, so when the field goes in through the surface, we get a negative contribution to the flux. But then that field line must again leave the surface somewhere else, and that'll make a positive contribution. And so the sum of the fluxes through our surface due to outside charges is guaranteed to be zero. The total flux through the Gaussian surface only depends on the charges inside it.